Yesterday, we had a low-end derecho move through South Dakota. There it is coming in the top left of the screen, heading towards Sioux Falls about noon to 1 p.m. Sioux Falls is located right here. The apex of that bow moves right through there. And as the system moves into Iowa towards late afternoon and evening, it becomes a little bit more elevated. Not as much high wind, severe weather, but very prominent mesoscale convective vortex right there north of Des Moines. Some good stuff to look at on the Sioux Falls Twitter feed. Most prominently, green skies were reported throughout eastern South Dakota. Now, I would be careful because some people will use filters and play around with saturation, but there have been enough reports that this has been a legitimate green sky event. And the photo you see here, that was probably unedited. And the DOT cameras probably were not altered either. As far as what causes that, well, if you go to the AMS Journal site, put in green and hail, You'll find this paper here from 1996 in the bulletin of the AMS, Green Thunderstorms Observed. That's the name of the paper. Now, this particular event, I don't think it really involved much hail. If it did involve hail, it was suspended aloft. And you can see here, not really any hail reports. The wet bulb zero height might have been unusually high. I'm not really sure, but... In any case, the main severe weather event has been wind and that track pretty much as you saw on that radar clip. Now, just a quick look through the wind reports, mostly ranging from 60 to 90 miles an hour. So this isn't quite as bad as the event we had last August. But on that Sioux Falls Twitter feed, this does show that they had a long wind event lasting about an hour which met severe weather criteria. All right, enough of that. Let's head into today's weather map. Frontal system from the East Coast through the Midwest into Colorado and up around the Central Rockies and back into the Pacific. Now, we do have some rather cool air in the San Joaquin Valley, temperatures in the 70s and low 80s. Typically, without this kind of air mass, we would see temperatures in the upper 80s to near 90. And you can see the wind down the valley showing a westerly and in some areas a northwest component. Also, it has dried out in Arizona. Look at those dew points there. 41 in Tucson, 36 in Phoenix. Last week we had 55 to 63 degree dew points. So it has dried out significantly and that's due to the increased westerly component. The prevailing westerly is taken over. And so instead of that southerly component to the winds aloft, bring in moisture from the Gulf of California, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Mexican interior, it's coming mostly from the Pacific. And as a result, a lot of the rain, thunderstorms, convection, and moisture field has moved into the eastern Rockies. We do have enough downslope in Texas to drop dew points into the 40s and 50s, but still some high-based convection in the Texas Panhandle. Dry line from about Dodge City through Childress and back towards Wink. And ahead of that, there's the moist sector. Some 70s dew points, especially up there in Kansas, but Texas itself, 50s and 60s dew points. So it has dried out a little bit, and due to the change in the specific heat of the air, that allows more heating to take place, and as a result, temperatures are up in the hundreds, 105 at Wichita Falls at this hour. Also in the southeastern U.S., a rainy pattern, and also in the Ohio River Valley, the proximity of the frontal system, allowing showers and thunderstorms to develop there. In the northeastern U.S., once again, seems like every day this summer we've had northwesterly flow, and I guess that's good for them because they don't need the heat. But it has been kind of a pervasive weather pattern, and that helps support troughing, long-wave troughing on the East Coast. And with that, kind of a cool, rainy pattern in the central Canadian region. And that's quite a change from last year when we had 120 degrees in British Columbia. Much cooler, 50s and 60s. 
All right, so let's check out Alaska and Yukon. It's warm up there. 79 at Inuvik at the Sour. In the Brooks Range, lots of 70s. And even up there in Victoria Island, 64, 57 at Cambridge Bay. So it is a little bit toasty up there near the Arctic Circle. Most of the cold Canadian air located up around Resolute, Crease Fjord, and Eureka. Heading out east, hardly anything going on, but it does look like some cool air is entrenched in Hudson Bay, Quebec, Baffin Island, and Newfoundland. And that helps provide a source of cool air that eventually infiltrates Quebec and New England. So probably a little bit more of that cool air on the way. So high pressure located right there, low pressure right here. That means at least another one or two days of cool weather in the northeastern U.S. And when that flips flops, when we get the high offshore, the low in the interior regions, that helps bring up the warm southwesterly flow from the eastern U.S. And at this hour, we do have some big storms going up in Kansas. Take a look at this area right here. Keep your eye on that region. It's going to be south of Russell, and you can see a big anvil going up. Let's check out the surface chart. There's a look at the surface chart. You can see the wind spiraling into this low pressure area located about right here. Frontal boundary located all the way out towards Kansas City. Another frontal boundary coming south. That's going to be the polar front arcing back towards Denver. And then somewhere in here, kind of an ill-defined dry line, somewhat like that. Not strong enough to prevent storms from forming to the west. Certainly there's a, enough moisture to get that stuff going. But the stronger stuff, that's where the deeper moisture is heading northwest. And as a result, convergence instability, all that stuff coming together right around the Russell Hayes area. There's a look at the radar animation out of Dodge City. This is a outflow boundary, or it could be the front reinforced by an outflow boundary. Whatever it is, it is surging south, and that points to a lot of cool, dry air coming down to the surface. Now, the cells out to the south, those look a little bit elevated, and that's not a surprise because temperatures are near 100, dew points are around 60, so that's about a 40 degree spread. That means very high bases, high LCLs. But up to the north, this thing looks a little stronger. It's certainly severe because the higher intensity is displaced on the south side of the cell as a whole. Now, if we go to the velocity, it does appear there is some circulation within that cell. Now the radar is located off to the southwest. We've got to really zoom in on this. This is where it helps to have a really good radar viewer. And there's the outbounds, there's the inbounds, and that's pointing towards cyclonic convergence. So there is a mesocyclone within this storm located about where I have that dot. You can compare that to the reflectivity can start picking out some supercell type structures. There's the inflow notch right there, all the strong southeasterly winds coming into the cell right there. And that's where we're going to look for a weak echo region or a bounded weak echo region. Do, do we have that? Now, what I prefer doing instead of doing a cross section, because you know you don't really know exactly where you need to be looking, I like to take the tilt starting with the bottom and go up to higher tilts. And with GR level X, you can use the up, up cursor to do that. And as we go up, I don't see a bounded weak echo region. I see a weak echo region. That's going to be right in here. If we had a bounded weak echo region, there would be a much different appearance. And I'll probably show that to you on a different weather cast. But the higher intensity tops right there, that's going to be up at about... 43,000 feet. So we're over the correct area. That's the top of the updraft where we have the condensation, where it's throwing out large hail, large rain particles, super cooled water, and ice. And as we go down, we see the notch, the weak echo region. So yeah, now if I go and do the cross section that paints out the weak echo region. Let me show you a graphic illustrating that. 
there we go. This is flip-flopped from what you saw earlier, but the concept still remains. Here we're looking towards the southwest. You can see the updraft rising right up into the upper parts of the storm, and there we have the higher reflectivities. And it's got kind of a cobra appearance here, kind of a ominous indication of the strength and danger of something like this. Now, the weak echo region, that's going to be associated mostly with hailstorms, with low-end severe storms, where we have a bounded weak echo region. It's going to look a little bit more like this. So as you go up to the higher tilts, you're going to eventually intersect that part right there. It's going to look like a hole. And when you have that hole there and you've got consistency between all the levels and you've got time consistency between product to product going forward in the future, that's going to be a clear indication of a beware. And down below that, you're going to be looking for tornadic indications. So obviously today we've got kind of a garden variety severe storm, but you know, you always want to be on guard for the possibility of intensification. So the basic structure on this thing, it's not going to look exactly like this, but this will give you a rough indication. You can see the inflow coming in right into that storm on the southeastern quadrant, the upper level flow indicated by the thick arrows. So you've got that divergence aloft, and that carries the storm anvil off towards the northeast. And down below that, we should find an outflow boundary. And already, yeah, I can kind of see that. That's located right there. It's good to be familiar with finding those outflow boundaries because if they're pushed way away from the storm, that indicates that the storm is having poor access to the inflow. I mean, you can still get some layers riding over the top of the outflow, but typically that tends to be associated with weaker phases of the storm. And when it has the outflow kind of pulled right up to the storm, kind of like that, that would indicate a much higher potential for severe weather. And I think that's probably what we're seeing right now. You can go to spectrum width to kind of resolve that a little bit. That might be it right there. And also your velocity will sometimes reveal that as well. Here, it's not of much help. And don't forget to look at different times. And there you can see outflow surging away from that cell complex. But it still looks like it's drawn into that hook part of this storm. And I think that's probably going to bear watching. Okay, let's shift gears and look at our records. Temperature records for today. We're expecting to break that at Abilene with 104. Also Jonesboro, Arkansas, tying the record at 102. For tomorrow, it looks like that heat is centered on Arkansas and eastern Oklahoma, tying the record at Memphis, Tulsa, and DeQueen, Arkansas. For Friday, much the same, 104 at Waco, 102 at Memphis. You viewers up north in Minnesota and New York, aren't you glad you don't have to deal with this? Yep, even more hot weather for Texas, 106 at Waco, and 98 at Denver, tying the record for the date. For Sunday, just got that heat wave locked in on Texas. 104 at San Antonio, 106 at Waco. And yes, once again, Monday, 104 at San Antonio, 106 at Abilene. And this is not really good news. 102 for next Tuesday for San Antonio. So very likely that heat wave will remain settled in on Texas. Fortunately, I guess the rest of the country is not having to deal with this. And for our forecast, there's really only two charts we need this time of year, precipitable water anomaly and the upper air chart. Let's look at precipitable water anomaly. This is showing a lot of moisture up there in the Midwest. This is a combination of advection, which has transported moisture up to this region. With that frontal boundary, we've got a combination of mass convergence, and also a lot of the moisture is being held in place beneath that inversion. And let's take a look at the progression. Oh yeah, also the monsoon. You can see the higher amounts of moisture over the eastern Rockies and less of that in the desert southwest. Going forward, looks like a rainy pattern for the Midwest. Not much going on in the southwestern U.S. or Texas. Very likely the higher elevations will be seeing some rain. 
That looks like some right there around Safford, down towards Lordsburg, and maybe Douglas. And it looks like that boundary has actually pushed south by this weekend into Texas. So that will probably bring our rain, rain chances up in a few days. Here comes another frontal boundary working its way out of the northern plains. That has a chance of stagnating once again in the southeastern U.S. Well, yeah, this one makes it to the central Appalachians. The tail end does make it into Texas. You can see plenty of dry air advection coming into this region right here. This is later next week, around the 14th. So I think we are going to see the precip chances start to come up in Texas, Arkansas, Mississippi, Georgia. It's going to be a good pattern for that kind of thing. And it looks like also some moisture increasing in South Texas as well. Big moisture increase in the deserts. Let's see when that starts. Yeah, that's going to be a gradual increase that starts over the weekend. So we're going to be back in the monsoon pattern next week in Arizona, Nevada, California. So that definitely points to a change coming up next week. It is continued <laughs> cool and dry in the northeastern U.S., plenty of cold air coming south, but we are going to be seeing chances of rain coming up in this region right here. And just looking at the pressure field, doesn't look like we're seeing any tropical activity. No hurricanes, no tropical storms. So we're going to get a breather on that, it looks like. And here's the upper air chart. What we want to find is the jet stream. I'll mark it for you real quick. That's going to be it right there. We also have to find anti-cyclone centers. There's definitely one right there in Missouri. I don't think I see any other centers, but that points out that clockwise flow. And you can see why it's so hot in Texas or Arkansas, Kansas. They're beneath that heat dome. So does this pattern change? Let's take a look. Run that forward into the weekend. There we go. Looks like that high backs off into Florida. We start increasing the westerly component in the central U.S., so that'll take the edge off the heat a little bit. And then by the 10th and 11th, you can see that high kind of works its way back into Texas. So no wonder the heat remains in place. Meanwhile, a series of troughs moving across the northern states, a progressive flow pattern. And eventually we kick some of that cold air southward. And that should carve out that trough a little more strongly towards the end of the period. That's it right there. You can see the flow turn around to the north. This is all prevailing westerlies right here. We've completely broken down that upper level high. And it looks like it's reformed maybe over the southwest deserts. Now, we do know that we're going into a monsoon phase. I don't know if the monsoon is still going to be going on by the 15th. But that definitely points to a lot of hot weather across the southwestern states. I, I think the monsoon may shut down, especially with that northeasterly flow right there. But if this high ends up moving to the east, that will bring the flow around to the south in Arizona, and that could bring up some of that monsoon moisture towards the 20th. But that's pretty far away. We'll have to see what happens. And that's all for this edition of Forecast Lab. I want to thank our new Patreon supporters, Ryan, and Raphael Sigenthaler. Thank you very much for your support. We'll be back here once again on Friday. Hope we'll see you all then. Take care and have a great Wednesday evening. Bye-bye.